You are listening to an Elam International Church podcast. Right now, we're going to hear another powerful Sunday message. And our prayer is that you are encouraged and empowered to love God, love people, and make disciples no matter where you are. We are doing a series on the parables. And um, Jesus often communicated um, this way throughout the Bible And basically, it was a way to illustrate an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And tonight, I'm going to bring you a message on the parable of the Good Samaritan. And and before we get into it, I just just want you to know two things. that um, The Good Samaritan, like the title of the Good Samaritan, is considered an oxymoron. You know, where two words actually contradict each other, like bittersweet deafening silence and things like that because the Good Samaritan was basically an oxymoron as Samaritans um, in biblical times were hated. They were considered enemies of the Jews, yet Jesus used a Samaritan to tell this story. And secondly, you may have heard this story many, many times before, but can I encourage you to lean in anyway and hear the story as if you're listening to it for the very first time you've ever, ever heard it. Let's start reading in Luke. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And this is basically the words that are on our wall over there, our vision statement, love God and love people. Let's just carry on. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I'm going to get into the next part of this parable, but what I'm going to ask each and every one of you to do is to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to picture this story unfolding as I read it. I want you to picture the characters as some of the people you might know in everyday life. And I'm also going to ask you to see if you can picture yourself somewhere in this story. And whatever you see, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that until the very end. Let's carry on with the story. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, remember this is the one that was the enemy, As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, which is, what, two days' wages, let's say, $200, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think, this is Jesus asking, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you that your children want to hear from you and you want to speak to your children. So I pray this morning, Lord, as this word goes out, that it will accomplish everything that you intend for it to accomplish. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open, that our hearts will be receptive to hear what you want to say, Father God, and see what you want us to see today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm the kind of person that values my privacy. I'm the introverted extrovert. Like I like being around a whole group of people. I like talking to people, chatting to people. But there's moments when 
I just want to be by myself. I just, amen. I just want to have nobody talk to me, nobody bother me. Uh, my, what, what some, I guess nowadays you'll call it your social battery is depleted. Yeah, I'm, I'm like that. I get like that pretty, pretty often because I pour out a lot and give it to people. And I just want to be by myself sometimes. Can anyone besides Courtney relate? <laughs> Lots of hands going up. A few years ago, it was my day off. My day off from work. And I was going to the supermarket. And I was so excited. I put my headphones on. My headphones on means I'm not going to talk to anyone. And if I see somebody, I'm going to pretend I didn't see them. I'm just going to walk up this way. So I saw someone in the supermarket. And I was like, whoop, I'm just going to go over here just for like, and pretend like I could see someone waving to me. And I just, you know how you kind of like look in the corner? Yeah, I, I know sometime you guys do that. But anyway, I went and I got all my snacks and everything. I was just going to go and spend the whole day hanging out with the Lord on my day off. And when I got, like, I, start, I went to go walk home, and at the end of the alleyway is our house. And I noticed that our gate was open. And as I got closer to the gate, I noticed that there was a bike outside the gate and a trolley filled with blankets, pillows, somebody's belongings. And I'm like, oh, great. Because we had just been renovating our house, and we had an issue with people who were um, homeless, and they had been sleeping on our property, they had been breaking into our house when we went there, and they were doing drugs, doing things, and um, so I thought, oh great, that's someone, because there was a trolley outside. I walk through the gate, and on the scaffolding in front of me, I see a man, and he's eating what looks like chicken and chips, and there's a bottle of wine open, he's eating it, and he's drinking, and I'm like, uh, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm eating my chicken and chips, and I'm drinking my bottle of wine. And I was like, fair enough, because that's the question that I asked, what are you doing here? And I was like, I'm not, I mean, like, what are you doing here, but what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm eating my breakfast. <laughs> and I'm like, no, uh, what are you doing on my property? And he was like, oh, I just thought this place looked abandoned. So I thought, like, you know, that you didn't actually live here. So I thought I could come here, have my chicken and chips and my wine, and sit here and eat. And I was like, okay, this guy's really getting, interrupting my day. He's interrupting my day off. So I was like, okay, can you just get your stuff and can you just get out? <laughs> just get off my property, get out. And he was like, oh, I just, he's collecting his stuff, picking up his wine. And he's like, do you want this wine? And I'm like, no, I don't drink anymore. <laughs> But if you asked me like five years ago, I would take that one. He's like, no, take all your stuff, hurry up, take your trolley, take your bike. And he goes, oh, I just wanted to say, I look through all the windows. You've done a really great job with the place. It's like, hurry up and get out. I don't have time for this nuisance. I wonder if sometimes we can see people as a nuisance. Come on. You can be real in this room, everybody. You don't have to pretend. I wonder if the priest... And the Levi thought that the beaten man on the side of the road was a nuisance. You know, it was something that they just didn't have time for or they didn't really care for. You know, as I read the parable out aloud to you tonight and asked you to close your eyes, what did you see? I knew for a fact most of us in this room would see something different in every element of the story because the world around us, the culture, our upbringings, our experiences, our lack of experiences, all help shape what we see individually. I mean, that priest from afar immediately crossed over to the other side, out of sight, out of mind. The Levi, he got a little bit closer, and then he crossed over to the other side of the road, another sort of out of sight, out of mind. And the Samaritan as we know in the story, was the only one who stopped. And I was like, that's my guy. The extra mile guy. The hero of the story. And perhaps you could see yourself springing into action like him. Because how dare those guys leave that poor beaten man on the side of the road, bruised, beaten down, and half dead. I felt really challenged 
to bring this message today because as believers, we are good at many things, but we can always be better when it comes to people. If we are being honest, I know most of us will like to stop and be helpful because that's the kind of people we are. But what if that person was homeless? What if that beaten person on the side of the road that you pictured in that story had just finished having a drinking binge? What if it was the person that you saw swearing at you the other day? The person who might have abused you on the street or the person who bullies you at work or school? If you saw that person, would you stop? Because when the teacher of the law asks, who is our neighbor that we should love? Jesus didn't respond with whoever falls in that category. He responds with this parable about what kind of neighbor we are called to be. How many times do we see people and we only see their problems? We think, what's that guy's problem? Or she's a problem child, or he has a problem with authority or she's going through lots of personal problems. She has an anger problem. He has mental health problems. Or we say, that's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem. Maybe it's DCM's problem. Maybe it's Wynn's problem or social services problem. Or maybe that's the community pastor's problem. Too often, we can be guilty of seeing people only by their problems. But I felt that the Lord wanted to tell us tonight to see people differently. That we would look past the problem and see the person. You know, when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, I think we often take those words lightly, like, just be kind, just do good, just be loving. And, and those, are, those are good things. But Jesus meant more by this, that when we love our neighbor, we don't look at them as they are, but we see them how he sees them. And Job it says, are your eyes like those of a human? Do you see things only as people see them? Job is talking here about supernatural vision. And I believe that God wants his children to see with supernatural vision tonight. Vision that looks deeper than what's on the surface and is able to perceive what is happening and not just focus on the circumstances that we see in the natural. You know, many of us pray for eyes to see and ears to hear, and for a heart that breaks for, for what God's heart breaks for. But too often that is a personal request for our own lives, to see him move in our own lives, and seldomly it is for the benefit of God's people and God's will for his people. But God wants us to see beyond ourselves, that we would no longer have tunnel vision, and out of sight, out of mind perspective, We'd have no more blind spots, and we would see in the peripheral. We will see what's really going on. In Matthew 13, it says, But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. And I pray today that we would no longer see people with our physical eyes, but see with our spiritual eyes. That when our default response is to see someone's brokenness, or see a nuisance, or see a pain, or see a problem, instead we would see that somebody's darkness is an opportunity for us to bring light into the situation. That when we approach people with our natural eyes, our spiritual eyes then take over. Instead of what's John's problem, we go and ask John, what's going on with you? And be prepared to step in and help. Now, if I'm being honest and I'm being honest with you and you're being honest with me. Some people are easier to love than others. This was the reason the teacher of the law asked Jesus who was my neighbor. Because, you know, for, for him, some people didn't qualify as his neighbor. He was asking, Jesus, where do I draw the line? And, and we do this ourselves. We go, where do, we draw, where do I draw the line, Jesus? What about the toxic person at work? What about the angry person in the car behind me shouting? What about the person who is attacking my character? What about them? Are they my neighbor? And am I supposed to love them? And John says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. 
So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The true test of this kind of love is when we are faced with circumstances and situations when it's not easy to love. Loving others will mean loving those who wrong you, accuse you, humiliate you, or abandon you. Those that hurt you don't deserve it and which you, you may deem unlovable. You know, a few years ago, I saw a man who was homeless by my house, and I have a lot of these stories of that because we live in an area um, where there are a lot of people who live on the streets. And um, I immediately, I saw him and I immediately ignored him and said to Ali, oh, let's go get our coffee and our muffin. And when I was purchasing it, oh, well, actually, Ali had to go in the shop because I stayed in the car. I said to Ali, can you get an extra one? Because I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, get him a coffee and get him a muffin. <clears throat> and I remembered um, I was a bit nervous. Like, I, this would be my first experience talking to someone who lived on the streets. I was like, I don't know what to say. Like, what do you say when you go up to someone and the Holy Spirit said, I'll give you the words to say. Just go do what I ask you to do. He's got the coffee and the muffin, and we get up there, get out of the car, and I walk over to the guy, and I say, and out of my mouth comes, hey, I got your breakfast. He smiles, and he says to me, that's very kind, and I notice there's a bottle of whiskey and a packet of Tim Tams next to him, and he notices me noticing the whiskey and the Tim Tams, and he points to it, and he says, it's not actually a good way to have a breakfast in the morning, is it? And then I start to ask him, oh, so how did how, this happen? How did we, how'd you get here? And he tells me about his job that he lost. He tells me about his family that he lost. He couldn't afford to go out on his own, and he's now living on the streets. My coffee and my muffin seem so small in comparison to his situation. You know, when the priest saw the man, he crosses the road. The Levi saw the man. He got close and crossed the road. But when the Samaritan came to where he was, he got close enough to see. And that's when it said he took pity on him. You know, in order to look past the problem and see the person, we need to take a closer look and get up close and personal. Most times we don't want to get up close and personal to someone because we have already made a judgment or we don't understand their situation, or when that person has really hurt or wronged us, we don't want to walk into the firing line or anything. But Ephesians 4.32 says this, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Can I encourage you to take a closer look? Get up close and personal to see the person. You know, people are the sum of their experiences, and not all their experiences are their fault. Ask God to give you revelation of what's going on. You know, the angry boss that keeps putting pressure on you, the toxic co-worker who keeps throwing you under bus, the significant other who doesn't trust you, or the friend at school that keeps making rumors about you. I guarantee you that under that person's behavior is a story. Now, I'm not saying you should get up close and personal if it's unsafe. Always be checking this with the Holy Spirit. But ask God to give you your heart understanding. Pray for that person. Pray for their breakthrough, pray for their healing, and pray for their salvation. Have you ever racked your brain over something somebody did and thought, why did that person do that? Like you try to psychoanalyze a person, you know, because you think, how could they think that? Or how could they do that? Like, why did you say that to me? Why did you call me that name? Why did they criticize me? You know, before, I would get easily offended or feel some type of way when that happens, but that actually says more about me. When people criticize me, I need to know who I am. When people doubt me, I need to know where I stand. Where people mock me, I need to learn to laugh about myself sometimes. Often our offense comes from our insecurities that we actually haven't dealt to. And unfortunately, we live in a day and age when offense is as common as breathing. Criticism is running rampant. Everyone does dumb things. No one is always right or knows everything because we are all a work in progress. 
Now, maybe there's a good reason for why they are like this, or maybe they are just human. I don't know any perfect people walking around this earth, do you? I'm so glad there is no perfect measurement that God is holding me and you up against. So we need to make allowances for people's humanity. When we look past the problem and see the person, we don't jump to conclusions. We give them the benefit of the doubt. But even if it's just a misstep, a mishap, or a mistake, we're not going to hold it against them. We have got to be a people who are not easily offended or critical. The Bible tells us to love our enemies. Pray for those who persecute us. Put that person on your prayer list. When you are praying, God gives revelation. And perhaps the reason they hurt us has less to do with what we originally thought. Maybe their own insecurities overtook them in that moment. Perhaps they are having a hard time. We need to extend more grace to people. Is this speaking to anybody today? People just aren't out to get us. Remember, the Bible tells us our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it is the flesh and blood that we always have fights with. Take it out on the devil. Go to war with the devil. Take your fight to the secret place. Tear down strongholds. Go against the enemy. Bind him up. Pray for the people that persecute. And I know it's not easy at first, but maybe it won't be the most heartfelt prayer in the beginning. Because I know. But I tell you that God honors any one of his children who humbles themselves in obedience to him and prays for those who persecute others. As you pray, God does a work in our hearts. When I love my neighbor, in spite of my pain or hurt, we create room for God's love to bring us healing. You know, I love how the Samaritan just sprung into action. I mean, he immediately went to work or service or whatever you would call it to the injured man. And oftentimes we can feel ill-equipped and unsure how to deal with a situation. I mean, if we found ourselves on that road as a Samaritan, would we know what to do? The world tells us that there are processes to follow, procedures to be aware of, steps to be taken. If you are organized, analytical, also known as a control freak, then you will know, that's that guy, you will know, nah, nah, jokes, uh, what I'm talking about. But having spiritual vision means that we are aware that the Spirit of God is always upon the chaos, right? When we come across people, the helper of the Holy Spirit will give us wisdom, will give us courage, will give us confidence. Sometime last year, we were at a cafe, and um, it was me and Ellie and Patsy over there, and we hear a crash behind the counter. And one of the co-workers had collapsed. Uh, the Holy Spirit basically spoke to all three of us at the same time and said, get up and go and help. Now, I'm not really sure what I was doing, but I heard the Holy Spirit, so I stood up. And then I just walked behind the counter, and I see that the guy is having a seizure. I walk behind the counter, and I'm like, what can I actually do? Holy Spirit, tell me what to do. He says, remove the plates and the glass. Make sure his head is safe and give him space. And so I do it. Now, the people who didn't move at first are now behind the counter. And they start barking orders at me. Uh, do you know what you're doing? Do you know if he's going to be okay? How are you going to do it if you don't even know what to do? What are you doing there? Do you have first aid? And I was like, I wanted to say, no, shut up. I can't hear the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but I just smile, and, and my husband sees my face. So he's like, hey, everybody, can we just step back over here? And Patsy's over there hugging the other people on this side. And I was like, God knows what he's doing. Aces in their places. The cafe owners are in shock. They just don't know what to do. They start crying, and Ellie's with them, and Patsy's with them, hugging them, telling them everything, telling them what to do. Um, an ambulance comes, and um, he ends up getting checked out. And a few weeks later, my husband sees him on the street, and his name is Hamish. And um, they get to talking, and he was thanking them, and they find out that he was a Christian. And I love that God placed his people in that space, on that day. We didn't know that he was a Christian, but we just did what we were asked to do by the Holy Spirit. 
you know, supernatural wisdom was granted to each of us in that moment. And I mean, I, I, like I said, I hadn't even done a first A course then, but now I have. So if anyone needs me, <laughs> you can ask Boyd if you can ask me. <laughs> when we move with the sole purpose of helping one another, know that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us in the chaos, directs our actions so we know what to do. Some of us can't fathom that in a moment we can be given supernatural wisdom. But it's true. Don't ever think that you are going into a situation on your own, that it's too hard to handle or too difficult to manage. I think we always say to ourselves, I don't know how to deal with this person or that situation, but we are the carriers of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We bring the Holy Spirit onto the scene. That's guidance. That's wisdom. That's understanding. That's basically everything we need. Will I listen to my flesh and look at the problem, or I listen to the Spirit and see the person? And I'm nearly finished. If you want to fulfill our callings as Christians, if we want to walk in the will of God, then our love for God and for people needs to be at the forefront. Now, often we pray against poverty, job opportunities, but never personally feed a hungry family or help somebody find a job. Broken people need someone to show them compassion and give them life, not merely talk to them and pray for them. Now, not only did the Samaritan spring into action, it took work. He had to walk with him to the inn, pray for him, pay for him, follow up, and settle bills. When you love your neighbor, there will be a personal cost to you. Monetary in this case. But it could be walking with people, following up with them, see how they are going, and praying for them. Coming alongside someone takes work. And Lucas says, if you love one, only the people who love you, what praise should you get? Even sinners love the people who love them. If you do good only to those who do good to you, what praise should you get? Even sinners do that. A few years ago, given the community portfolio as part of my job, and one of Pastor Boyd's, uh, his heart was that we would can reconnect with DCM who look after people who are experiencing homeless in the city. Now, I wasn't really keen, to be honest, because, you know, I just told you about the guy that was having chicken and chips and drinking, the other guy that had a muffin and a, and a coffee, and I was like, oh, why me? Why can't it be someone else? I'll do community, but not that community. <laughs> and God saw my heart in that moment. And you know what? I spent a whole year, 12 months, serving DCM every single Thursday. I would prepare lunches with their team and go to community centers where their recently housed clients were. I was asked to connect with them. I was asked to talk with them. I was asked to serve them. And um, I got to hear some pretty amazing stories. Got to hear how things just went pear-shaped for a lot of people and how there was a relationship breakdown, increases in rent, just everyday things in life, addictions that they couldn't get under control and which resulted them to being on the streets. And now, after that one year, I'm still walking alongside the people of DC and we still walk alongside them as a family, church family, because of the Fano Freezer that was started under this ministry that feeds the clients of DCM in emergency housing. And thousands of meals are being prepared for by the people in this church and they're being prepared for the people that I once made judgment on. You know, last serve day, we collected for their food bank. And every week, my goal is to support and get alongside them, some of the most marginalized and misjudged people in our society. You know, and we can throw money at things, and, and don't get me wrong, we need money. So keep throwing your money to make the meals, to feed the people. But there are so many heartbreaking stories that I get the privilege of hearing because I simply serve them. How can you serve those around you where it's not just a nice gesture, but it's actually cost you time and service? When was the last time you served your community, signed up for a serve day? Other places in the world, in the, uh, you know, other businesses, they actually have community service days. And those are great. And they are simply serving just to help. 
But service from the children of God is different. It leaves a spiritual deposit in people and in the atmosphere. And the Bible says that we are to seek the prosperity of the city that we are called to. Because when the city prospers, then we prosper. Don't just, can't just be a people who point out the problems. But we want to be a people who do something about it. That doesn't wait for the church to do it. Why isn't the community pastor doing this? Why isn't the church doing that? You are the church. This is all our responsibility to take care of people and come alongside them. Look past the problem and see the person that God wants you to reach. I'll bring the keys up and I'll finish. Thanks, Lily. In Matthew, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, the Greek word for compassion here is like your gut is moved all the way deep down like you have a stomachache. That when you see with your spiritual eyes, you're so moved. This compassion that the Samaritan had is the same compassion that Jesus had when he saw the crowd without a shepherd. The same compassion that the father of the prodigal son had. The same compassion that the unforgiving servant had. The eyes of the spirit will change our perspective and will move us into action. You know, the Jews' hatred of the Samaritans had historical roots, but it was the Samaritan who had pity and stopped. The one who wasn't supposed to be helpful, the one who wasn't supposed to be loving and caring, was the only one in the story who stopped. The last serve day, we were serving at a food bank for DCM at um, New World on Willis Street. And there were a few homeless people outside on the street asking passers-by for money. Have you got any money? I'm hungry, I could hear them say. During the time, there was a woman who had been given money and she went into New World to buy herself some breakfast. And she walked out with a sausage. And she walks over to me and is reading the signs for the food bank. And she says, is this for DCM? And I say, yes, it is. She says, ah, I know those guys. I know those guys. And my initial thought was that she was gonna ask for some food. And I, I don't work for DCM, but I thought, oh, you know, if she asked for some food, I'm going to give her some food. So it's been donated here. But she takes the loose change in her hand. She said, I just got my sausage. So here, maybe this can pay for somebody else's sausage. You know, if I'm being honest, not much has changed since this parable was told by Jesus. For us today, we still see what we want to see. When we want to see it, we choose to stop or not stop, help or not help. Every day, we are faced with that choice. And it's often hard to see. I know. I know. It's hard to see past the mess and see somebody drowning, somebody just scraping through. You know, that angry coworker who might be in an abusive relationship, that person calling you toxic might be just facing months to live. Do you see that person on the street sitting with an empty bowl in front of them asking for money? Do you think it's for their next hit? Do you think it's for some more alcohol? Or do you see them asking for money because maybe that next hit will mean they don't need to wake up to the life that they never imagined? When I asked you to close your eyes earlier, when I told you that story, and as I've been talking to you, I wondered what you saw. What do you see? I want you to close your eyes again. And I want you to picture that person who was beaten, badly bruised. I want you to look again this time. Do you see his naked, broken body just laid out for all to see? Do you see them half dead? Now imagine that's you. Can you see yourself? What if that broken body is you, laid out for all to see? Your weaknesses, your mess, your brokenness. Can you see yourself on that road? That somebody just sees your problem? Oh, that's the woman with depression. Oh, that's the one that's not confident. Oh, that's the one that struggles with anxiety. 
that's the one who had abortions. God's saying, there's many of us out there in desperate need of Jesus. What do you see? Because once you were a sheep without a shepherd, once you were a sinner in need of a saviour, but someone was given eyes to see you, they opened their vision, they saw only what Jesus could see, they looked for you, they sought you out. And I'm so thankful for Jesus that we are not known by our problems, but known as his children. And I'm going to ask you to picture one final thing, your eyes still closed. Now, instead of that broken, bloody person on the road, half dead, being that man or even yourself, imagine that's Jesus. What would you do? Would you look past Jesus? Because Jesus said, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. Micah 6, 8, it says, the Lord has told you, human what is good he has told you what he wants from you to do what is right to other people love being kind to others and live humbly obeying your God Heavenly Father I pray for every single heart here today I pray that you would give us vision help us to see what you see Lord help us to see more than just me help us to see beyond the person help us to see with the eyes of Jesus, the eyes of compassion, without judgment and just love. There is a dying world out there, people on their last breath, clinging so tight. I pray, Lord, that you would tear the veil so that we can see. Let us look through the eyes of love when we walk out of here because that's what sets us apart, that we don't see like everyone else, that we have spiritual vision, and we don't see problems, but every single time we see the person that you so desperately love, that you would leave the 99 to get that one. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we worship the Lord together? Thank you for joining us for an Elam International Church podcast. To hear more messages like this, make sure you check out below. Or for more details, you can find us at www.elaminternational.org.nz.